Here we have one long sentence that ends with a full stop. And this long sentence only consists of one independent clause. So it means there's nowhere I could put a full stop in here and have two separate subject verbals on each side. When we have an independent clause, we always need to have a verbal. And this verbal always has to be finite. And finite means that it is inflected for tense that we can see if it's the present tense, if it's happening today, or if the past tense, then it's yesterday. In this case, both this is sort of a tricky verb because it, when we just look at this verb, it could be the present or the past tense, but not, not if it has the subject he, then it would be he puts if it's the present tense. So we know this is the past tense, actually. And there's also a different, another verb, over here, that can tell us that this is exactly the, pres the past tense, because this is inflected with ed. This is also a finite verb. So finite mean, means it is finished, it has been inflected, you could say. Who put? He put. So he is the subject. Who opened? That is also he. So this subject has two verbals, we can see. Then, uh, we look a little more closely at the rest of the sentence. And in fact, we can find that the put is not only alone in this verb, because there's a small thing attached to it, which could be a preposition, or a small r adverb, or a noun that doesn't mean that much. So in this case, it is a small preposition or adverb that can be difficult to decide. Uh, it's a verb group, and the head consists of a main verb, and then we have to say a, a little preposition or a little uh, appendix of some kind. Mm -hmm. So this is grown together, these two words have grown together into one verbal meaning, meaning he placed the brooch, for example. So when we can replace the whole thing with one verb, then we know that this is actually called a phrasal verb. So we can write that in parentheses to remember that. A phrasal verb, and there are many, many phrasal verbs. Then we have a direct object. What did he put down? How did he put it down? That's the circumstantial manner. Then we have the coordinating conjunction. A coordinates in this case, case two verbals. Or you might argue that there is an invisible subject here that is implied and there's ellipsis. What did he open? A drawer, which is a direct object, and then you can argue, we can discuss whether behind the counter is part of the drawer, that it is sort of describes the drawer, or if it indicates the place of the drawer, in which case it is a circumstantial. And I'll leave it like this because this is not the interesting part. The interesting part comes when we look at the second part. So now I'm going to erase. Uh, no, it's, I think it can be analyzed mm. here. All of this, taking out a metal biscuit tin filled with envelopes and cards, all of this tells us about the circumstances during which he opened the drawer, etc. And while he was doing that, he took out a metal biscuit. That's really the meaning of all this. So it's some kind of circumstantial. Um, it could be time, or it could simply be the circumstances during which it happened. And this is actually a stop clause. I cannot find a central element, and I can see that there is a verb. But this verb is different, because if we compare it with put and opened, we can see it isn't inflected for tense. I cannot see if this is happening yesterday or today. I have to look at the verbs in the rest of the clause to see if it's yesterday or today. So therefore we call this non-finite. This is called non-finite. And non-finite verbs, they can either, I'll just write it here, non-finite can either be the inform, as we have here, which is also called the present, uh, Participle, or it could be a past participle, which would be if I took the verb take, it would be taken, 
or it could be the infinitive, the one we look up in the dictionary, which would be to take. But in this case, it is um, it is in ink form. Can we analyze it like all other ink forms by finding the name verb? Taking. And it really means he put down the brooch reluctantly and opened the drawer behind the counter while he was taking out. So this is while he was is implied here. And if this had been there, I could see tense on it. And I could see the link to the previous sentence, I could see the conjunction, and I could see the subject. But this is invisible here, this is implied. So it's reduced into just a verb, you could say. So I have to guess from the rest of the sentence that who is actually doing this is the subject, he. And that it's the past tense because the rest of it takes place in the past tense. So the first verb in the verb group, which would have been was, is always the one that is inflected for tense. Like all other verbs or verbals, um, this can take different uh, sentence consists, constituents. And as a matter of fact, the out is connected to the verb taking. So taking out, removing altogether. So again, it's a phrasal verb. What did he take out? A metal biscuit tin filled with envelopes of cards. All of this is a direct object where we see that the most important element is tin, which is a noun, so it's a noun group. In front of that we have a pre-modifier, which is another noun, biscuit. And then we have the material it was made of, it's another pre-modifier, which is, well, you could argue whether it's an adjective or, an ad or a noun here. I think I'll treat it as an adjective. And then we have a determiner, which is an indefinite article. Now it gets a bit messy. Yeah. Over there. And then we have something that describes the tin uh, after the head, because the biscuit and the metal were before the head, so they are called pre-modifiers, but we have something after the tin, so that must be a post-modifier, filled with envelopes and cards. And that's actually another non finite subclause. It's a subclause because it has a verbal, and it only has a main verb, and in this case it is uh, the past participle. Um, it means which was filled. So we can see that it is really a relative clause because the which has gone missing and there is a to be which was missing as well. And that would have been a, 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 an auxiliary verb. Um, and then we have what it was filled with. That must be some kind of manner, circumstantial, which is a prepositional group. And then I'll leave it like that, I think. So what was important here was to see that sometimes subclauses, the verbs in subclauses are not inflected for tense. Uh, they can be in the inform, in the past, participle as we saw over there, and we haven't seen the example of an infinitive, but they are also found. Whereas if we, we, we have the independent clause, the verbal in the independent clause always has to be inflected for tense. So it's only in subclauses that we can find non-finite clauses. Yeah. Okay, we'll look a little more closely at this prepositional group with envelopes and cards. That has a preposition which is with, which is why it's a prepositional group, and then it has um, a prepositional complement. The thing about the thing after the entity after the preposition is the prepositional complement, and that 
consists of a noun group, and this is a little bit special because this noun group actually has two heads. One is envelopes, and then this is coordinated by one of the coordinating conjunctions, and, and then it has a second head, which is cars, and also a noun. And it's typical, like we said previously, that that the coordinating conjunctions and or but can coordinate things of the same kind. In this case, case two nouns. Or you might also say it was two noun groups that are coordinated. Whereas up here, you had two verbals that were coordinated. 